If we knew the full kinetic parameters for every enzyme and its concentration in a compartment, knowing the future state of the system is entirely deterministic. We can write differential equations for each species as it changes over time, then solve these equations and predict the dynamics. In practice, we have not yet achieved the ability to exhaustively parameterize all the various rate constants needed to describe biochemical systems at this level of detail. Sure, we can measure things like KCAT and KM for an enzyme in vitro, but they sometimes do not correlate with the observed rates in vivo due to matrix effects or localization effects. Also, it's very expensive in terms of human effort to obtain such data with current practices, thus very little of this data is available. The result of this is that we can only do approximations of this full simulation of the system. Flux balance analysis is a simplification to the massive set of differential equations that could describe the metabolism of the cell. It is one of the most popular methods for modeling the metabolism of cells. In flux balance analysis, we represent the lump sum total of the cell's biochemical reactions by a stoichiometric matrix, called S, of size m by n. One row of the matrix has m compounds that exist in the system, and each column represents one reaction that occurs in that system. The values for each cell in the matrix are stoichiometric coefficients. For example, if a chemical A was converted to B and C, one molecule of A is consumed and two molecules, one of B and one of C, are generated. Thus it is minus one for A and plus one for B and plus one for C. If you have a decent biochemical map of what each enzyme is doing in the cell, you can curate a stoichiometric matrix describing all species and all reactions in the cell. Suppose I have two enzymes in pink that interconvert three species A, B, and C. The flux of material through that node in the network is a number in terms of concentration over time. We are used to the ratio of concentration as it changes over time for a specific species, but now we are talking about a rate of flux through the enzyme instead. We can describe our system of enzymes as a vector of length n where n is the number of enzymes. Each value of the vector is this flux through the corresponding enzyme node. We can then describe the changes in concentration of each species in terms of these flux values. The system is assumed to be in a steady state. Flux is traveling through these nodes, but they have reached some quasi-stable condition in which the flow is balanced out amongst the many reactions, so dx dt equals zero. Or in other words, the concentration of each chemical is not changing, but change is of course still occurring, it's just that all the change is canceling out. Notice that the add in info to write these differential equations involves adding plus one or minus one stoichiometric terms to each flux term. Thus each differential equation can be seen as the sum of each stoichiometric term multiplied by each flux. These stoichiometric terms are what we just wrote out in the constructing the stoichiometry matrix. If we just make it n dimensional for each species, then we can describe the system as just S times V equals zero. The stoichiometric matrix dot product with the flux vector equals a vector with zero at each position. Many solutions for V exist and one of them is correct. This real value is called the objective function. Unfortunately, there are many solutions to V that would satisfy any S. Thus, we cannot immediately calculate the real one. To identify more realistic values of the objective function, constraints are placed on specific entries in V derived from either thermodynamic or observed values for the flux of specific reactions. It is a new thing to constrain uh, these models using extensive experimental data such as C13, MFA, or NMR methods. The MFA approach involves following an isotopically labeled metabolite through the metabolic map using high resolution mass spec techniques. Specific NMR methods involve following enriched metabolites or following atoms that are distinguishable by the methods such as following fluorinated metabolites. So what can you do with MFA? In the context of scale up optimization, FBA can be used to predict genes whose knockout might improve expression. A single gene in the genome is associated with a small set of reactions. If you were to delete that gene, the value in the stoichiometric matrix becomes zero. 
By recalculating the objective function, you can predict the effect of the gene knockout. You can also consider what will happen when you take your engineered organism from media composition to another. Here you would add additional species to the stoichiometry matrix to include the new chemicals you have added and then look to see what happens to your target product concentration as a result. Today, FBA is primarily used as a hypothesis generating tool. It turns out not to be granular enough to make precision predictions, but is very helpful in visualizing how your system works and gives you ideas on how to modify it. The root cause of the imprecision is primarily the lack of sufficient kinetic parameters to constrain the objective function. FBA also requires a steady state assumption. It is unclear whether this is okay. The media composition, size, shape, and general health of microbes are known to be strained in a bioreactor, and whether a quasi-steady state assumption is an, is an acceptable approximation is unclear. Typically, these models do not account for regulatory effects simply because so little of that information is available. If such data did exist, it could be accounted for in these models by studying the data. It is also unclear whether the stoichiometric metric matrices are correct. They depend on experimental data which we know to be incomplete and sometimes false. Typically cells are modeled at the level of complexity of a few thousand molecules or fewer. When cell extracts are measured by high-resolution LCMS methods, hundreds of thousands of chemicals can be observed. We don't have a full catalog of the reactions going on in the cell but perhaps we have the most prominent ones in terms of degree of flux. Thus it is unclear whether this actually compromises the predictions of FBA. The predictions it makes for gene knockouts are usually good for first shell predictions. By this, I mean enzymes that immediately divert flux from one of your intermediates. Suppose you have the sequence A to B to C, and there was an enzyme that converted B to Y. FBA can show you these situations and predict that knocking out the B to Y enzyme will increase flux to C. Library approaches to optimization are usually the norm. When you begin making chassis modifications like knock-ins and knockouts, you are not only changing the flux through a pathway but also the viability of the organism. The viability of the organism involves its growth rate and stress effects. These ultimately affect the production efficiency of the fermentation and thus are entangled with this isolated idea of flux optimization. As a result, the mutations that improve performance are often strange in the sense that they often have nothing obvious to do with the enzymes in your system. For example, if one of your introduced chemicals accumulates and causes membrane stress and this greatly hampers growth, then improvements to membrane homeostasis are of primary importance. Such aspects of the system are currently beyond the scope of FBA models. 